and president and CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, and the Ark Encounter. Thanks for joining us in Legacy Hall to hear from one of our excellent speakers, Brian Osborne. Brian holds a bachelor's degree in biblical studies and a master's in education. For 13 years, Brian boldly taught Bible history in the public school system. He's since joined Answers in Genesis as our curriculum specialist and a very popular speaker. Brian helps parents and ministry leaders recognize the growing epidemic of biblical illiteracy and what to do about it, including using resources like the Answers Bible curriculum. At this time, please silence all cell phones and note that emergency exits are located up front to your right and left and along the left side of the room. Now, let's give our full attention and a warm welcome to Brian Osborne. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good? Having a good day? Who's a little bit tired? It's okay. It's 3 o'clock. You can be honest about that. Very good. Who's here at the museum for the very first time? Wow, look at that. That's typically the way it is. Glad you're here. Who's uh, been to the Ark Encounter? Very good. Who's going later on? Anybody not going? Okay, good for that as well. All right. Well, hey, glad you are here. Welcome on behalf of Answers in Genesis. And I'm glad you're here for this particular session because it is one of my favorites. We're going to be talking about dinosaurs. Anybody else still love dinosaurs? Even as an adult, maybe out there, not afraid to say it. I know I do. They're fascinating creatures. Uh, I love them so much. My wife and I made the first ever snow wrecks a few uh, years ago. All right. Now, I confess it does look like a white Barney, but we did the best we could with what we had. And a few years later, we taught our son to make these little dinosaurs as well in the snow. Our son, Ian, loves dinosaurs. And as a ministry, we love these creatures. They're fascinating. We have them all over the place. As you walk through the uh, Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, we have dinosaurs everywhere, animatronic raptors scaring kids half to death. Uh, one of the best Allosaurus fossils in the entire world that God has blessed us with, with the name Ebenezer. And by the way, the name Ebenezer has a biblical reference, not a Christmas story reference. You can check that out more later on if you would like. We love dinosaurs. Lots of people love these creatures. And because of that, and because of the nature of our ministry, a question we get quite often is this one. Well, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And our answer tends to surprise people. Our answer is, well, how do you do it? You don't. People say, wait, don't you guys believe in them? Absolutely. But here's the thing. We don't try to squeeze things or fit things into God's Word. What we do is we start with the Bible and use it to explain the world around us, including dinosaurs. And that's what we'll do during this session. We're going to stand on God's Word and use the biblical worldview, use biblical history to rightly understand these amazing creatures. In a sense, we'll put on those biblical glasses and use a biblical perspective to answer questions about dinosaurs. Because what the Bible does for us is it gives us the big picture of history. It gives us the right understanding of the past that we apply to the evidence in the present. And then we can properly understand dinosaurs and see that real science confirms what the Bible clearly says. And it's something I want to say right off the bat, and it's a really important principle we'll come back to numerous times. And this is what this is referring to, is that ultimately this issue of dinosaurs and how old they are and their origin, the age of the earth, rock layers, fossils, distant starlight, isotope dating, and so forth. Guys, ultimately, it's a worldview issue. You see, because all scientists, whether they're secular or biblical, they've got the same stuff in the present, the same rock layers, the same fossils, the same DNA, the same starlight in the present. But here's the key. They interpret those things differently in the present and make different guesses about where those things came from and thus their age based on their different starting assumptions about the past, based on their different worldviews. And here's the simple but yet profound point. If you start with the wrong assumptions, you'll most likely get the wrong conclusions. Have you ever experienced that in your life? Uh, guys should raise both hands, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think we all have. Got a little story to kind of drive this point home. Uh, I haven't told this story in a while, but here you go. Does anybody know what this is right here? You didn't? What is it? There you go. It is a calf puller. And for the rest of us, we're like, that's a what? 
Yeah, that's a calf puller. Evidently, when a cow's having trouble giving birth to that baby calf, you take this pole, push it against the cow, take this cable, attach it to the calf, and you crank the calf out of the cow. I've never seen it. I've never done it. I don't want to, all right? <laughs> but there's a story I know that involves one of these. You had a farmer that had a cow giving birth, but it was a breech birth. The calf was coming out backwards, hind legs first. So he had to use this calf puller. Just so happened, this was all taking place by the side of the road as he's doing this thing. And as he's doing this, a city guy drives by, and he sees this train wreck happening on the side of the road. And so the guy slams on his brakes, pulls over, runs up to get a closer look. The farmer looks up, he sees the guy, he kind of laughs to himself, and he says, hey, have you ever seen anything like this before? And the city guy said, no, I've never seen nothing like this. The farmer said, do you got any questions? The guy said, yeah, I got one. The farmer said, let's hear it. The guy said, well, just um, how fast was that calf going when it hit that cow? <laughs> Some of y'all get that later, all right? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Not separating a wreck, all right? But again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And friends, secular scientists have reached some really wrong conclusions about certain things, like the age of the earth and universe and dinosaurs and so forth. Why? Because they're starting with the wrong assumptions about the unseen past. They're trusting man's word over God's word about history. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Do you know a great example of this is the issue of the age of the earth? Did you realize up until about the late 1700s, early 1800s, most scientists believed the Bible and thought the earth was only thousands of years old? That's true. So then what did they discover in the early 1800s for many of them to change their minds, reject the Bible, and instead believe in millions of years? What did they find? Well, I'll give you some hints. It was not new rocks or new fossils. They had the same rocks and the same fossils. It was not radiometric dating. That comes in the early to mid-1900s, and is wildly inconsistent. So what did they find to change their minds? The answer is actually nothing, at least nothing tangible. You see, what happened is some guys like James Hutton and Charles Lyell and many others, they popped up on the scene, and they suggested this. They said, you know what? We don't need Noah's flood to explain all these rock layers and fossils. They said, you know, we can explain all these rock layers and all these fossils with only natural processes. If, if we give those natural processes enough, what do you think? Enough time. And this is where the idea of millions of years was born. Not based on any new evidence, same rocks, same fossils, but a different interpretation that starts with the assumption that God's word is wrong about the past and that man's word is a better starting point. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And what was the motivation in this shift in foundation away from God's word about the past? Well, Charles Lyell said it well in a letter to a friend that his goal was to free science from Moses. Translation, get God out of science. Because ultimately, guys, this is not a head issue. It's not an intellect issue. It's a heart issue. And then it becomes a worldview issue. But from that point in time, the majority of the scientific community adopted this naturalistic worldview. And here's the thing. Once you start looking at the world in a particular way, it can be almost impossible to see it in any other way. In a real sense, you can get brainwashed. Has anybody in here ever been brainwashed before? Maybe me, or me and you, right, but just a couple. Do you guys mind if I try to brainwash you real quick since you've never done it before? That'd be fine. One, he said, sure, thank you. All right, yes, I got one. <laughs> you guys can blame him later. All right, now, <laughs> I'm going to try to brainwash you. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell you a story. At the end of the story will be two questions. Now, if you know these specific answers to those two questions, congrats, you've not been brainwashed. But if you don't know, I brainwashed you. I got you to think the way I want you to think, and you most likely have no idea how it happens, and I'll bet it happens in the very first sentence. So here's the story. If you, don't, if you know the answers, don't say anything. Just raise your hands when I ask. It goes like this. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. And he jogged a little ways and turned left. Jogged a little ways, turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. And he jogged back home. As he's jogging back home, he noticed two masked men were waiting for him at home. That's the story. Here are the two questions. Who were the masked men and why did he leave home jogging? If you know the answers, just raise your hand. 
couple back there. All right, all right, right here. All right. So it looks like around 96% of you have been brainwashed. Congratulations. And I've been there before, trust me. But I'll give you one more shot, all right, just to be fair. One more shot. Here it is. Story one more time. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. I'll give you a hint. Left is important. He jogged and turned left. He jogged and turned left, and he jogged back home. As he's jogging back home, he noticed those two masked men waiting for him at home. Again, who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? Anybody new get it? Anybody new? Well, a few of you out there. All right, very good. Awesome. You did a lot better than I did the first time I heard this. All right, so still around 93% of you are brainwashed. And I know how you feel. I've been there. And don't worry. I won't leave you there. I'm going to unbrainwash you. And I'll do it with a simple picture. And when you see this picture, you'll probably kick yourself or maybe your neighbor and think, why could I not figure this out? So simple. Ready? Here we go. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. <laughs> he jogged and turned left and turned left and turned left and he jogged back home. And the two masked men were the catcher and the umpire. By the way, I tried this illustration in Malaysia, just in Malaysia. It did not work. Baseball's not big over there, right? I had no idea. Um, why couldn't you think of that? Well, most likely when I said he left home, what did you think of? A house, a home, right? He went jogging probably for exercise. When he came back, the masked men had to be robbers or bad guys. And notice, once you started interpreting those words in that particular way, it was almost impossible to see them in any other way. In a real sense, you were brainwashed. Can I show you how millions of kids today, multiple generations, have in a similar way been brainwashed? Give them a book like this that says, I can read about dinosaurs. And what do you think are the first words in the book? Ah, you guys have this book too. That's right. Millions of years ago. Here's another book. First words, millions of years ago. Beloved Dr. Seuss. Not the first words, but millions of years ago. Or you can think about it like this. You can meet little Joey here who's five and about to start school. Public, private, homeschool, Christian, it does not matter. And he already knows about things like evolution, the Big Bang, ape men, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. How? Meet his preschool teachers. Oh, but they're so cute and harmless, right? But guys, I think in many cases, we as Christians fail to recognize a very important truth, and that is this. We are not the only fishers of men. And dinosaurs had been one of the main baits that the secularists used, driven by the enemy, whether they recognize it or not, to reel people, especially kids, into a secular evolutionary worldview that basically says the Bible's history is not true and cannot be trusted. But here's the bottom line we must remember. And this is so relevant to everybody today, but especially younger generations. If we cannot believe the Bible's history, why on earth trust what it says about salvation? And that makes sense, right? If you can't believe the beginning of this book, why would you trust the middle or the end? And for so many today, especially younger generations, that show in multiple studies, around two-thirds of kids today who grow up in church are walking away from the faith by the time they reach college age. Why? Because they think this book's been disproved by ideas like modern-day science, evolution, even, and so forth. If you can't trust the first part of the book, why trust the middle or the end? And guys, that's why it is so important. That we are indeed obedient, obedient to God's word, to give an answer for our faith, where it's being attacked today, defend the faith, and proclaim the gospel effectively. That's why we need answers about dinosaurs. So let's put on those biblical glasses and get some of those answers. According to the Bible, on which day were dinosaurs created? Day six. Very good. How do we know? Well, because we drew two T-Rexes in that picture, and that proves it. Actually, why do we draw two T-Rexes in that picture? Does the Bible explicitly say when God made the T-Rex? It does not. But can we figure it out with some basic logic? We actually can. Think about it. T-Rex is a land animal. And by the way, dinosaurs, by definition, are land animals with a certain hip structure. Uh, technically, things like uh, plesiosaurs, uh, swimming reptiles, or pterosaurs, flying reptiles, are not technically dinosaurs, although they're usually associated with them. But dinosaurs, by definition, are land animals. T-Rex is one of those. The Bible says land animals were made on day six. Therefore, T-Rex was made on day six. Who can figure this out with no help at all? Right? It's really straightforward. 
And we must admit, and this is important to understand, the Bible is not a science textbook. The Bible doesn't give us all the details for geology and biology and so forth. For example, the Bible does not list every name of every animal ever created. Actually, it's very few of them. But it doesn't list all the names of all the animals. And I'm glad about that. Could you imagine trying to read through that list as you read through your Bible? Anybody read Leviticus or Numbers? <laughs> right? That's rough, right? I know, it's tough. Plus, we do have proof positive that Adam lived with the dinosaurs because here is a picture that Eve took right there. <laughs> Just being silly, all right? But, and some say, okay, but wait, if they were made on the sixth, then why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? And it's true, we do not find the word dinosaur in the Bible. For the same reason, we don't find words like locomotive, rocket, Facebook, or Twitter. The word dinosaur is a very new word. Was not invented until 1841 by a guy named Sir Richard Owen. Basically means terrible lizard. Wasn't really used that much until the early 1900s. So, of course, we do not expect to find the word dinosaur in those earlier English uh, translations. The word itself was not even invented yet. But interestingly, there is another word in those older English translations before evolutionary thinking became dominant that in many cases seems to describe known types of dinosaurs. And that word is dragon. Translated from the Hebrew word tanim, repeated numerous times throughout the Old Testament. It's more flexible than dinosaur, but in some cases it describes dinosaurs, it would appear. One example of Psalm 74, 13, thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters, maybe referring to the chronosaurus or something like a plesiosaur. There's also a couple places in the Bible where it appears that even God himself describes a dinosaur. In the book of Job, very good. In the book of Job, God told Job to behold a behemoth. And the word behemoth just means a monstrous beast. And God wants Job to look at it, so it's a real creature. And if you remember the context here, uh, God's kind of showing Job his creative power and putting Job in his place. Job, I know you don't understand, but trust me, I'm God. See my creative power. I love you, and I got you covered. Kind of showing Job that through this example. And there are a lot of study Bibles that may suggest to us, you'll find in a many, that behemoth was possibly a hippo or an elephant. But let's see if the description given in Job fits a hippo or an elephant. It goes on saying in verse 16, Behemoth's strength is in his loins, and his power is in his belly. And so in other words, behemoth has a big belly. And of course, elephants fit that description. Hippos do as well. I would argue he's got a bigger belly, he wins, but they all have big bellies. All, right? all three of those creatures fit that part of the description. Verse 17, though, is where we draw some lines of distinction because it says this, that behemoth's tail sways like a cedar. What's implied there are the cedars of Lebanon, really big trees. Behemoth's tail sways like a big tree that sways back and forth in the wind. That is what his tail looks like, a big tree swaying back and forth in the wind. You ever seen the tail of a hippo or an elephant? <laughs> Those are not tree-like tails. Maybe twigs, not trees. So take a tree-like tail, put it on a hippo, does not fit, Right? Put it on an elephant, scares a poor guy half to death. It's okay, I know it's scary, all right? But no. Put it on a sauropod dinosaur, a long neck dinosaur, it fits the description really, really, really well. And by the way, that leads to an important little side note, and that's going to be this. If you have footnotes or study notes in your Bible, those things can be handy, but let's remember your footnotes and study notes are not the inspired Word of God. The text itself is the inspired Word of God. And I've heard it put like this, you don't really use your footnotes to understand your Bible, you use your Bible to understand your footnotes. Or the best commentary on the Bible is always the Bible, it's the ultimate authority, exactly. Verse 18 goes on to say that his bones are like tubes of bronze, his limbs are like bars of iron. Here's the front leg of a brachiosaurus, those would be like bars of iron. Here's me standing against a replica of a brachiosaurus, Chicago Field Museum, those would be like bars of iron, the actual bones. Verse 19, he is first among the ways of God. He is the biggest example of God's creative power for Job to see on land. And from all those things being said, it appears that God is describing something like this to Job. Job, behold, behemoth, who I made along with you on day six, feeds on grass like an ox, like we know from the fossil record, confirms that. Tails sways back and forth like a tree in the wind. Now, of course, I got that clip from which movie? Jurassic Park. Who's seen Jurassic Park? All right, bunch of heathens. Okay. 
who's seen all four for research purposes only like myself? You just got to get in there. And, <laughs> and of course, watch out if you watch those movies. A lot of violence and bloodshed and so forth in those movies. And also be careful. In all of them, they're trying to convince you that some dinosaurs evolved into what? Birds. It's a common theme throughout all of them. If you watch closely, you'll see the nuances. But moving on, another creature mentioned in Leviathan or in Job called Leviathan. Uh, something may have been the chronosaurus, maybe a plesiosaur. We can't be sure about that. But it's just a fascinating creature. Again, it gives a long description in Job. It's a real creature. God wants Job to look at Leviathan and be in awe of his creative power. And it gives you this description that says he's amazingly aggressive and powerful. Uh, don't mess with him. But then it says some pretty amazing stuff about Leviathan. That his sneezing throws out flashes of light. And his breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from his mouth. And now it's not just a dragon, but it's a fire-breathing dragon. And all the guys are like, that's cool, all right? But of course, people say, but wait a minute. Come on now, Brian. Are you telling me that you guys had answers believe in the possibility of a fire-breathing critter? Well, before you discount that possibility altogether, take a look at what God did with the tiny bombardier beetle. Known to scientists, it's the bombardier beetle. When threatened, it fires out a burning liquid at a temperature of over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, almost boiling point. It does it by pumping a liquid fuel into a reaction chamber where a catalyst ignites the mixture. The burning chemicals have nowhere to go but out and with a bang. <laughs> so that little guy basically shoots out liquid fire out his backside. It's just what he does, all right? He can do it up to 70 times in a row as a defense mechanism. Aim it at any direction. It kills other insects, small mammals, and it's actually harmful to human skin. Now, if God can do that with a less than one-inch beetle, what could he do with a multi-ton beast like Leviathan, right? And think about some of the other things God has made. We could be here all day on this, but the amazing creations God makes that do amazing things, even things we take for granted, things like lightning bugs, and most like catching those, right? My son just loves catching those right now. We caught a bunch the other night. Yeah, these things are amazing. Do you realize that the chemical reaction that takes place inside of them to produce that light is 100% efficient? No energy is lost in the conversion, which is astounding because most of our lights lose about 90% of their energy in the form of heat. But God's design is better than ours. Imagine that, right? Or things like the electric eel. This animal makes electricity all on its own. That is an amazing thought. And by the way, if you just found the bones of an electric eel, you most likely would not know it produced electricity. And besides all that, most animals produce methane, which is a flammable gas. Really, all you need is a way to ignite it, and you've got a flamethrower. So lots of ways to explain that possibility with Leviathan. And then moving on. There are so many others we could talk about. A couple of examples of flying dragons mentioned in the book of Isaiah, the flying fiery serpents, and other things we could mention. Same sort of references again and again. Those are probably pterosaurs. And someone would say, okay, well, that makes sense. But then here's my question. Brian, if dinosaurs lived with man, then what did they eat? <laughs> and it's good. We've all watched Jurassic Park, so we've kind of we've got twisted views on this. But what did they eat biblically, at least originally? And so... But it's a good question. So what did dinosaurs eat? And let's word it like this. What did the original, what did the first T-Rex eat with those big old teeth, according to the Bible? A, B, C, or D? What do you think the answer is? A. Very good. You guys know the answer is A. Now, for those who don't, and you're asking, how do you know that? It goes back to that great Sunday school answer. The Bible tells us so. Genesis 1, 29 and 30, in the perfect creation before man sinned, God told Adam and Eve they were to eat fruit. And then in verse 30, he taught all the animals that with the breath of life in them, they were to eat plants. Originally, everything was vegetarian before man sinned. And that's a weird thought to us today, but it makes really good biblical sense because the Bible is clear. And you see it in Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation, all throughout the Bible, that it was man's sin that brought death and suffering into this world. And this means you cannot eat meat until after man's sin. Because when we eat meat, we're eating an animal that has what? Died. Before his sin, there is no death. Everything has to be vegetarian. Makes really good biblical sense. So originally, the T-Rex, just like all other things, was vegetarian. They ate things like fruits and vegetables, pineapples and coconuts. 
And some push back and say, but wait, you tell me that animal, those six-inch serrated fangs, ate things like fruits and vegetables, pineapples and coconuts? Absolutely. Got a question. Have you guys ever tried to bite into a coconut? That's a bad idea, right? That's like a redneck famous last words. Hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> Nothing, all right? I'm from North Carolina. It's okay, all right? <laughs> no, we get a knife to get into a coconut. T-Rex was just pre-equipped, all right? And also think about it. If you find the fossil of a creature, and it's got big, long, sharp teeth, what's the only thing we know for sure about that creature? It's got big, long teeth, right? There are lots of creatures today with big, long teeth that are primarily or only vegetarian, even in our fallen, messed up world. A couple examples of that. Look at this primate from South America. Look at those teeth. That's scary, right? He is primarily vegetarian. Or look at this skull. Look at those long, carnivorous-looking teeth. That's got to be a meat eater, right? Well, that skull belongs to a fruit bat. You get only one guess as to what a fruit bat eats. <laughs> exactly, they eat fruit. <laughs> or look at that skull. Look at those teeth. That must belong to a vicious meat eater. No, that skull belongs to a vicious bamboo killer. <laughs> or this one's always fun to look at. Look at these saber-tooth-like teeth. That's got to be a meat eater, right, if it's still around, and it is. No, that skull belongs to something called the Chinese water deer, nicknamed the vampire deer for obvious reasons, and it is a real creature, and it's really vegetarian. And we could just go on and on with so many other examples if we had time. But the point is, originally, especially, Adam and Eve can hang out with the lions and the tigers and the bears. Oh my, right? They could bring a T-Rex home as a pet. Just be sure there's enough room in the house. <laughs> but you know what? That's the way it was, and that's not the way it is. What happened that changed everything? A three-letter word, sin, changed everything, exactly. And we put it as the second C of our seven Cs, the second C of the corruption, Adam's sin, bringing death and suffering into this world. And by the way, this fundamental history answers one of the most fundamental questions every human has, and that's this. If there's an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God, then why is there so much death and suffering in this world? And the atheist today would word it probably something like this. There's no way a good God made a world like this full of death and suffering and bloodshed and so forth. And ironically, they're right. You see, biblically, did God make a world like the one we live in today? Yes. Now, see, the Bible's clear. God made a perfect creation. No death, no bloodshed, no disease, no cancer. It was perfect. Who wrecked this world? We did in our sin. And you don't blame the manufacturer for the perfectly good car that you wrecked. We wrecked God's perfect creation. And by the way, even though we wrecked God's perfect creation, God shows his love, his mercy, his grace, and his justice by providing a bridge of salvation for us even after we wrecked his perfect creation in our sinful rebellion. That is the biblical God. That's how we understand that issue from a biblical perspective. But again, man's sin changed everything. It brought death and suffering and bloodshed into this world. Romans 8 puts it like this, that all creation is groaning in pain because of man's sin and wants to be fixed back to the way it was before man's sin, back to that perfect state. But let me show you something with you that's really important. And I think many Christians are missing uh, the main point on it. I did that a long time as well. If we try to squeeze millions of years into God's word, like so many try today, no matter how you try, if it's the day-age theory, gap theory, progressive creation, theistic evolution, framework hypothesis, <gasps> cosmic temple, there are many others. They all have one, at least one, fundamental theological flaw. And please understand this. They all put death before sin. Theologically impossible for multiple reasons. Because here's the thing. If you reject the idea that Noah's flood laid down most of the rock layers and fossils, and you instead believe the secular idea that those rock layers and fossils were laid down over millions of years before man ever existed, and thus before sin, and those rock layers supposedly deposited before man and before sin, we find evidence of animals eating each other. But wait, the Bible says originally before sin, everything was vegetarian. We find in that fossil record things like brain tumors, diseases, cancer, arthritis. But wait, the Bible says God looked down on day six before man sinned and called everything very good. 
Surely he would not call millions of years of death and suffering and bloodshed and cancer very good. If he did, he's not a very good God. And by the way, if that is true, this makes God the author, originator of death. Not only that, he used millions of years of that death as part of his creative process. It's not the biblical God. That's an ogre of a God. We find thorns in the fossil record, supposedly millions of years old, but the Bible is clear. Thorns came after a curse. They're a result of the curse. That's why Christ on the cross wore the crown of thorns, bearing the curse on our behalf. And then most important of all, if we try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, and please watch this, this tends to be a light bulb moment for so many Christians as it was for me. No matter how you try, you put death before sin. And here's the thing. If there's death before sin, then death is not the consequence or the payment for sin. It's just always been around. Part of God's original, very good creation. And if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death does not, cannot pay for our sin debt, and we are all still lost in our sins and bound for hell. And we just destroyed the foundation for the gospel, whether we meant to or not. And at best, at best, we've made this unnecessary. And can I just tell you, this is why we care so much. Our ministry is not about winning a debate. It's about defending biblical authority and the gospel based in that authority. That's what's under attack. That's what's at stake. That's why this matters so much. And that's why we're so passionate about it. But it's not until after man's sin that the die for dinosaurs would have changed, like it did for many other creatures. Not until after the flood that God told Noah, just as I gave you plants to eat, now you can eat all things. You can eat everything. Which, as we joke as a ministry, this is why you need a hot dog. Because it is everything. <laughs> and it's not until after the flood that God told Noah, I'm going to put the fear and dread of man into all the beasts of the earth. So after the flood, animals will be scared of man. So keep that thought in mind for a little bit later on. And so for many, we get to this point and they say, okay, Brian, I pick up what you're putting down. And so uh, God made dinosaurs. Originally, they were very good, but man sinned. Maybe they became a threat at that point. So maybe, what if God just let them all die during the flood? Which is not unreasonable to think, but is that what the Bible says? The answer is no. You see, in Genesis 7, 15, it tells us this, that pairs of all creatures with the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. That would actually include dinosaurs. And some say, wait a minute, dinosaurs on the ark? How could Noah fit them on the ark? Matter of fact, how could Noah fit all of those animals on the ark? So let me answer the bigger question. We'll talk about dinosaurs in the midst of that answer. When someone asks you that question, there are two main questions we should push back with. The first question should be this. When someone asks you how to know get the animals onto the ark, we should say, first, well, how big was the ark? Second question, how many animals do Noah actually take on the ark? Answer those two questions, and this answer really isn't that hard. So first, how big was the ark? Do you think it looked more like A or B? <laughs> Thank you for saying B, all right? Why do so many arcs look like this in our children's books, Sunday school curriculums, Bible studies, and so forth? They present Noah's Ark as an overloaded bathtub. Giraffes always sticking out the top, right? <laughs> and I know these pictures are meant to be cute for kids, but kids are so impressionable. You show a kid this picture, does that tell that kid, Noah's Ark and Flood, real events or fairy tale? Fairy tale. And we're, we're re actually reinforcing a secular idea when we do this, whether we mean to or not. No, show them the real ark. It was over 500 feet long and 85 feet wide and 50 feet tall with three levels. It's a huge ship, a huge vessel. The dimensions give you the proportions equal to mostly a modern-day cargo ship with the right balance of strength and comfort and stability you would need during a global flood. Capacity equal to roughly 500 railroad stock cars, like an eight-mile-long train huge, huge ship. But was it big enough? How many animals did he take? Well, the Bible's clear. He took only land-dwelling, air-breathing animals onto the ark. No fish on the ark. Plenty of water outside the boat. All right? No whales, no dolphins, no jellyfish on the ark. Also, it makes good sense that he would bring young adults, or God would bring to Noah young adults. We'll get to that here in a minute. And then maybe the most important issue of all, where so many people miss this, is the Bible's clear Noah took two of each kind onto the ark. Not two of each species, two of each kind. 
And the word kind, for the most part, in the Bible is equal to about the family level of modern-day classification. So what that simply means is this. Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs with him on the ark. He most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life. <laughs> he was a blessed man. No. <laughs> he took two of the dog kind, two of the elephant kind, two too many of the cat kind, but two of the basic kinds of animals <laughs> on the ark. Snuck that in there, all right. <laughs> and some will say, but hey, aren't there just too many variations of dinosaurs? Aren't there hundreds, even thousands of variations of dinosaurs? Well, just like there are many variations of the dog kind, but just the basic kind, the same thing with cats and horses and so forth, you have a similar thing with dinosaurs. There are many variations of the ceratopsia kind, but just the basic kind. There are many variations of the sauropod kind, but just the basic kind. There are around 60 to at most 80 dinosaur kinds. Not that many. And some would say, okay, not that many, but I mean, come on. Really? <laughs> And that leads to a very common misconception. Do you realize that the average size of a dinosaur is equal to that of a bison, like a really big cow? And actually, some were as small as chickens. It's true. If those were still around today, we could have some good old KFD. <laughs> and of course, it would taste like what? Chicken. It'd have to. Exactly. You guys know. All right. Very good. <laughs> But as it turns out, we know that all dinosaurs started off small. You say, how do you know all? Well, because they hatched from eggs. And the biggest an egg can get is about the size of a football. Because the bigger the egg gets, the thicker the shell's got to be to support its own weight. But the shell can't get too thick because then oxygen can't get through to keep the creature alive. So max size for an egg is about that big. That means all of your dinosaurs, whether it's the stegosaurus, the T-Rex, the brachiosaurus, titanosaurus, seismosaurus, whatever, all started off about the size of a football. Now, that's really not that weird. We still see the same sort of thing today. Today, when crocodiles and alligators hatch from eggs, you can hold them in your hand. Give them a few years. If you're not careful, they'll hold you in their belly. <laughs> right? And plus, remember, God's bringing the animals to Noah. So I'm pretty sure God has it figured out. You don't have to bring the biggest ones. And it's reasonable to bet that God brought young adults to Noah for many good practical reasons. You bring young adults because they're smaller, especially the bigger animals, things like elephants, giraffes, bison, dinosaur. Bring, small, bring the young adults, they're smaller. And just be sure there's a pink one and a blue one, that's important later. And I bet God's got that figured out too, right? You bring young ones because they tend to weigh less, eat less, or sleep more. They can be tougher in particular ways. My son Ian is four years old. We love to tackle and run around and play and stuff. And sometimes when he's running around, Ian falls down and hits the ground kind of hard. But then he does something amazing to me, and that is he bounces, right? He just gets right back up and keeps on running. When I fall down anymore, I feel like I break or I lay there for a while, all right? So young ones are tougher in particular ways. And young ones, they will live longer after the flood to produce more offspring to refill the earth. And that's the whole reason you're taking them to begin with. So a lot of good reasons to take the younger adults. And then how many were there in total? We did a ton of research on this. And we have all this, of course, at the Ark Encounter here at the museum as well. But a max number of kinds that no one need to account for all the variation we see today and in the fossil record would be roughly around 1,400 total kinds. Multiply by 2, 7 or 14 is some. And in a max worst case scenario, you will need roughly 6,700 total individual animals on the ark. And that number fits very comfortably in that large ship. No problem at all. And that would include the dinosaurs. No problem at all. And then once they were on the ark, the Bible tells us this, that on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of heaven were opened. The rain fell 40 days and 40 nights. But it says the springs of the great deep burst forth, cracking the crust of the earth, moving it catastrophically all over the world, all at the same time, causing earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activity on a global catastrophic scale that wrecked this world. And because of that event, we would expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Guess what we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth tremendous confirmation of the Bible's historicity. And some would say, okay, well, that all makes sense, but then here's the thing. If, 
if the flood happened around 4,400 years ago and a lot of dinosaurs died during that time, then shouldn't we find some forensic evidence of dinosaurs living not that long ago? And indeed, we do. Oh my goodness, do we. We could be here for hours or days on this subject. I'll give you a few quick examples. We are finding over and over again, we're finding soft tissue, and back up here one, we're finding soft tissue from dinosaurs still intact in dinosaur bones. You say, what do you mean by soft? I mean, the tissue is still stretchy. It's still pliable. And many times in that tissue, there are blood vessels and red blood cells still intact which is astounding. For example, in this Triceratops bone, we see this same sort. We see this feature. We see it here in this duckbill dinosaur bone. We find this in this T-Rex bone. And we're finding this again and again and again. Now that we know to look for it, we're finding it all over the place. Soft tissue, blood vessels, amber blood cells still intact. And these organic remnants, they're made of mostly water, and they should not last more than hundreds of years after the creature's death. Maybe thousands in special conditions, like after a flood, but no way millions. Phenomenal confirmation of the biblical time scale. And we will look at that, and from a Christian perspective, we think, wow, okay, that's got to be a slam dunk, right? That's got to convince someone the evolutionary worldview is wrong and make them rethink their, their assumptions and their dates on these things. But it won't necessarily convince them, and here's why. Because as I said, as I said earlier, it's not a head issue, it's a heart issue. And then it becomes a worldview issue. And your worldview tells you how to interpret what you're looking at to make it fit your preconceived ideas. Let me give you a good example of what I'm talking about. I'll show you a little video clip of a brilliant, nice lady named Dr. Mary Schweitzer. She's the one who found this particular sample. But she's approaching it from an evolutionary perspective. And as she does, I want you to hear her conclusions. And as you hear these conclusions, just keep in mind the power of a worldview, the power of your starting assumptions. I'm not going to believe this. When she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched. And it sproined and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels, and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it. That's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump-inducing scientific moments. That's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. I think the presence of soft tissues and cells indicates there's a process going on that we didn't have a clue about. So I think it means that we have to kind of rethink the whole chemical process of making a bone turn into a fossil. Wait, rethink what? Don't rethink the age. You can't touch that. Notice what she is basically saying. There must be some chemical process that we have never, ever observed that is somehow making these things last for millions of years. And again, she's a brilliant lady, but I have one question. How fast was that calf going? <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Ultimately, a worldview issue. And some will say, well, okay, well, that makes sense. But then if there were dinosaurs on the ark during the flood, and they got off the ark, and they lived with men after the flood, then shouldn't we find some written historical documentation of that? Surely people would write about that. And indeed, they would, and they did. And we have a lot of accounts of this. But remember, the word dinosaur is a brand new word. Not invented until 1841, but before then they were called something else. And we find this name in pretty much every single culture all around the world. What were they called? Dragons. Dragons. And we find these legends, they're legion. They are all over the place in pretty much every single culture. Now, some are embellished, of course, but many don't describe known types of dinosaurs. And even the honest evolutionist knows about these. Watch this little clip from the Discovery Channel. There is one creature remembered in the legends of almost every human culture that's ever existed. A creature depicted with remarkable similarity by the Chinese, the Aztecs, 
Even the Inuit, who live in a frozen land where no reptiles are found, even they have stories of this animal, the dragon. Cultures from different continents, people who had no contact with one another, yet all of them have stories describing the same mythical animal. Could it be these stories were more than myth? What if we discovered that this creature that haunts our imagination had once been real? Now, of course, I'll try to explain those away with an evolutionary worldview, but the point is they acknowledge the legends. And there are so many of these. We have whole books on this issue. Just a few examples very quickly. Uh, St. George is said to have killed a dragon around 275 A.D. And the description of the dragon that he killed fits out of a dinosaur known as Baryonyx. And in that very same region, we do find bones of Baryonyx. A city in France renamed in honor of the dragon that was killed there, described as bigger than an ox with long, sharp pointed horns on its head. Maybe a triceratops of some sort. Uh, Marco Polo, the man, not the game, reported in 1271 AD that the emperor in China used dragons to pull his chariots in his parades. Which, by the way, if I was an emperor and there were dragons around, they'd pull my chariots too because that's awesome. All right? Which makes really good sense. Uh, Well-known historians like Aristotle and Herodotus, they reported seeing flying dragons. Herodotus may know this in his, in his writings where he went to go see these winged serpents as they flew for Egypt. And he says he saw them. And he says they were like snakes. They were reptilian. And their wings were not feathered, but they were membranous like the wings of a bat. The Historia Animalia, a very well-known old secular science book, said dragons were still around in the 1500s, but were rare by then and fairly small in comparison to those older dragons. You also find carvings and drawings all over the world that appears to show man with dinosaurs. A few examples of those. Here's a piece of ancient Egyptian pottery. seems to show two long-necked dinosaurs. A Roman mosaic from the 2nd century. Again, two long-necked dinosaurs. I'll go over to northern England, visit Carlisle Cathedral, see the tomb of Bishop Bell, who died around 1500. And there are brass strips around his tomb with carvings of animals on those strips. And some of those carvings look like known types of dinosaurs. Or go to Cambodia, visit this temple built around 1,000 years ago. Zoom in on the column of this temple. You have what appears to be a clear depiction of a stegosaurus, the dinosaur with the plates on the back. Bringing it back closer to home, over in Colorado, here's a pictogriff of quite possibly a triceratops. you got the big body, plated back of the head, three horns. Of course, the evolutionists say, no way, that's just a really bad goat. Those Indians were terrible artists. <laughs> but if you look above, they knew what a goat looks like. All right, they weren't confused by that. But it gets a lot better than that over in Utah, closer there. We find another cave wall drawing of what is clearly a sauropod dinosaur. You have the long tail, the four legs, the neck, and the head. A very, very clear depiction. Also close to there, another cave wall drawing of a pterosaur of some sort. It would appear to those distinctive features, the bump on the head and the webbed feet. Another cave wall drawing of a different sauropod dinosaur. Enhanced so you can see it better, but there you go. Here's a fun one to end on as far as this subject goes. This is a creature uh, given to us by the aboriginal people, and they called this creature Yavru. And they say Yavru was a real creature, it was a real menace. And in this picture, they're showing us the time that Yavru ate one of their friends. And they're trying to get their friend back or get revenge or something like that. Uh, and Yavru looks a whole lot what we call a plesiosaur. And guys, if we had time, we could just go on and on and on for a really, really long time. There's so many of these. And again, even the, the honest evolutionist knows about these. And they're going to be consistent. They need to try to deal with these from an evolutionary perspective, and some have tried. And it gets interesting when they try. One quick example. Have you guys ever heard of Carl Sagan? Maybe a few of you have. Okay. Because Carl Sagan was a popular scientist back in the day. He was a brilliant man and a staunch uh, non-believer and a staunch evolutionist, but definitely brilliant. And, uh, but he believed hard in hardcore evolution. And so he knew about these dragon legends all over the world that sounded like man with dinosaurs. And he said, we know that can't be true. But he said, then how do we explain all these legends of man with dinosaurs, at least what appears to be in these accounts? So he sought to answer that question in the book, The Dragons of Eden. And this was the hypothesis he put forward. He suggested, he said, well, we know evolution is true, he said. And we know that humans evolved from small mammal-like critters that lived millions of years ago. And these small mammal-like critters, these small mammal ancestors of ours, they lived with the dinosaurs millions of years ago. 
And the dinosaurs were so big and terrifying that the memory of the dinosaurs imprinted itself onto the brain of our small mammal-like ancestors. And then as those things began to evolve onward and upward, they kept passing on that memory to one thing over the next over the eons of time. And then some humans back in the day still had that vestigial leftover memory from their ancestors. And when those humans went to sleep at night, that memory would click on. Those humans had dreams of the old dinosaurian world, and they would see the dinosaurs their ancestors saw. Then they would wake up and write about what they saw or draw pictures of what they saw. And he said, that's how we get all these dragon legends that sound a lot like man with dinosaurs. Again, a brilliant man, but how fast was that calf going? Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Your conclusions are only as good as your starting assumptions, especially about the unseen past. Here's a quote from his book. In the dreams of humans, the dragons can be heard hissing and rasping, and the dinosaurs thunder still. The Bible offers a much better, clearer explanation about the dinosaurs. And then we end up with this question. People say, okay, that makes sense. But then here it is, the big one, the one everybody wants to know the answer to. Well, then what happened to them? I'm going to tell you, but hold on. This is where it gets really technical. You ready? This is what happened to the dinosaurs. Now, the question, of course, is why? And we'll get to that here in a second from a biblical perspective. But before we do, let's look at the evolutionary guesses because there are a bunch of them. We see them in the textbooks, very popular today, as I mentioned earlier, that many people suggest some dinosaurs evolved into birds, which we don't have time to elaborate now, but this is biologically, genetically impossible because natural selection and mutations shuffle existing genetic information. They don't add it over time. And you have to add new information to change a dinosaur to a bird. This is genetically impossible. Of course, very popular today is the suggestion that some meteorite or asteroid hit the Earth and killed all of the dinosaurs, big and small, but somehow left everything else alive. (laughs) Some have suggested dinosaurs died of indigestion, which is painful, if you ever had it. Some, and this is a real theory, have suggested that dinosaurs gassed themselves into extinction. And it means what you think it means. It really does. That um, what happened is, according to this theory, is that they uh, lost some of their previous foods or they changed their diets for some reason. They started eating the wrong sort of stuff, gave them upset stomachs. They released a whole bunch of gas, which released a whole bunch of methane into the atmosphere. That caused a greenhouse effect that increased the temperature of the earth. The dinosaurs could not stand the heat. (laughs) So many bad jokes go right there, right? I'll simply say this, that would be the worst kind of climate change. And I'll leave it there. (laughs) Something dinosaurs overrate, something they starved to death, something a natural catastrophe killed off the dinosaurs. I've got one more theory. It's my own personal theory. It's my own personal sense of humor. But I do believe this theory has a lot of explanatory power. Maybe this is what happened to the dinosaurs. Just throwing this out there. Chuck Norris has been around for millions of years, right? <laughs> just for, sort of feel like that. <laughs> just having fun. But seriously, so what happened to the dinosaurs? Why did they go extinct? I'm sure dinosaurs had many problems after the flood, but we'll make a good a biblical educated guess as to two primary problems they possibly faced after the flood. Here they are in no certain order. First will be this. Most likely, they're going to have to deal with climate change after the flood. And don't get confused. We're not talking about man-caused climate change like it's popular today, that idea. We're talking about God-induced climate change. You see, in Genesis 13, God told Noah that the purpose of the flood was to, yes, destroy the people, but also to destroy the earth. Part of the purpose of the flood was to wreck this world that most likely now we live in a junkyard compared to what used to be before the flood. And if you look, before the flood, people on average lived to be over 900 years of age. What do you do for 900 years? I have no idea, all right? But they lived for over 900 years. But then after the flood, then, here's your flood line, after the flood, it's just 400 years, then just 200 years, then just 100 years of age. They're not living near as long. Why? 
I'm sure many things affect this. Genetic bottleneck will play a big role in this. They're living in the wrecked world. There's an ice age after the flood, lack of form of food. A lot of things related to climate will be affecting people, and especially dinosaurs, after the flood, most likely. So most likely, that's one of their bigger problems. But then their second problem will probably be bigger than the first, and that's going to be this. People will be hunting them after the flood. Say, people hunt dinosaurs? Yeah. Remember earlier that God told Noah, after the flood, I'm putting the fear of man into all the beasts of the earth, which typically if something is scared of you, either they run from you or they attack you. And of course, the bigger the animal, the bigger the threat. So think about it. If you have, um, say, after the flood, you know, you have your people together, about 100 years later, you have the Tower of Babel, and you get new languages, and you're split up all around the earth, and you and your people start to move to a new region. And you run into a wild herd of chihuahuas. <laughs> Not dangerous, right? You're fine with that. Maybe you love it, maybe you hate it, but you're going to live. But let's say you move to another region. And over here in this region, you guys run into some lions or tigers or bears. Oh my, right? Or maybe a T-Rex or an Allosaurus or a couple of raptors. What are you going to do, guys? Well, kill the threat, right? Nothing will eat my wife or my son. We're going to protect our families, protect our crops. We're going to protect our lives. We will get rid of the threat just like people do today. Actually, most likely man will have dinosaurs for a lot of reasons. For the meat, be a lot of food. Because they're a menace. Even the smaller ones can be a menace. The herbivores eat your crops. To be the hero, to show you are superior competition for land. I think you can add one more good reason to this list. Fellas, let's be honest. If there's a T-Rex around today, what good man does not want a T-Rex head hanging on their wall? <laughs> right? Just saying. And by the way, all these things are the very same reasons animals go extinct today. Really nothing mysterious about this. Makes really good logical sense. And guys, I hope you recognize. And you see more of this as you go through the museum and the Ark Encounter. When you stand on God's word and equip yourself with a biblical worldview, we have answers to the questions of this age. We can defend our faith and we can boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I think of these dinosaurs, we call them missionary lizards. <laughs> For two big reasons. First, when you properly understand dinosaurs, we reinforce a truth that our culture and the church so desperately needs to hear today. You can trust this book. All of it. It's right about the past. It's right about the present. It's right about the future. Why? Because it is God's word, and it is right about salvation. Put your faith in Christ. So many people need to hear that message clearly articulated in a secular culture like ours. And then the second reason I think of them as missionary lizards is because when we think of dinosaurs, we should think of death because they're dead. And why are they dead? According to the Bible, it would be because of sin. The Bible says this, for the wages of sin is death. And the Bible also tells us this, that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And boy, is that a message our culture loves to hear. You see, you think about it. If you ask the average person on the street today, do you think you're a pretty good person? What do you think they'll say? I'm not that bad, right? I'm not Hitler. I don't know why Hitler's the standard, all right? But yeah, I'm not that bad. I try to help people. I'm decent. Sure, I mess up, but I'm a pretty good person. But you see, according to the Bible, if you want to get into God's heaven, you know what God's standard is? Perfection. Because he's perfect and will be around no sin without his wrath being poured out all in that sin. You want to get to heaven, you must be perfect your entire life. What that means is this. According to the Bible, if you tell one lie in your entire life, you are done, bound for hell. You steal one thing, one time in your entire life, you're bound for hell. Dishonor your parents once, bound for hell. Take God's name in vain just once, bound for hell. But then the news gets worse according to the Bible. God not only sees our actions, he sees our thoughts. He sees our motives, and he requires to get in his heaven. Those must be perfect as well. Your entire life, never a lustful thought, never a coveting thought. Your motives are always God first, people second, yourself last. Perfection, our entire lives, is God's unyielding, eternal standard to get into his heaven. Any honest person would say, but besides God, Jesus the God-man, nobody can do that. That's the point of the verse, is it not? That's why the Bible says all have sinned and all fall short. And this is why everyone, every one of us, we all 
need a Savior. We all need that because we cannot reach God's standard on our own. That's the bad news that we've all sinned, which starts in the book of Genesis, by the way, where we see the first sin. We descend from that Adam. We're all sinners by nature and by choice. But that's why the good news is so good, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the righteous for the ungodly, that if you will, Romans 10, 9, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I tell that to you for two reasons. First, if you are not a believer here today, if you're watching and you're not a believer, I plead with you, repent of your sins, put your faith in Christ who has paid the price on your behalf if you will set them as your Lord and King and God. Every breath you take in your unsafe state is God's mercy on your soul, giving you one more moment to repent, one more chance to come back to Him and to get eternal salvation instead of eternal damnation. What an incredible exchange. And he's paid it all for us. And also, I do this for a second reason. Number two, <clears throat> if you're a Christian here today, notice what I did. I went from dinosaurs to the gospel. I gave answers to get to the answer, Jesus Christ, because, I, guys, that's what apologetics is all about. It's about standing on God's word, defending the faith, in order to declare the answer, Jesus Christ, to a lost and dying world. That's what we do. That's what we're passionate. That's what we encourage and equip you to do as well. We've got a lot of resources to help you do that. I would encourage you to check out the book, The Lie, the foundational textbook of our ministry. It's kind of why we do what we do. It's a great place to start for why all this is so important. For the answers themselves, tons of answers to all sorts of really good questions in these four books. Some of the best-selling apologetics books in the world. About 30 questions answered per book. Really well done. A great resource for Bible study, personal study, homeschooling, whatever. Encourage you to check those out. Kind of like Answers Book 5 would be a flood of evidence based on, uh, deals with a lot of questions related to the flood and the Ark of Noah's Day. We consider these six kind of our initial six core resources. If you've got to start somewhere, that's where we encourage you to start. I also encourage you to check out the book Gospel Reset. This is Ken Ham's uh, brand new book, our CEO of the ministry, his brand new book, Gospel Reset. talks about how do we effectively evangelize a culture like ours today that is very, very secular. See, the culture's changed. The gospel never changes, but our culture's changed. How do we engage a secular culture? This isn't the 60s anymore. It's or the 50s. It's a different culture. How do we engage people today to be effective in sharing the gospel? I encourage you to check that out. A great small group study would be this one, Ken Ham's Foundations Curriculum. Six of his talks divided in half, 12, 30-minute sessions. Study guide to go with it lays a firm foundation on these issues within your small group or within your church. Another book I highly recommend would be this book, Quick Answers to Tough Questions. And I really highly recommend this book because it is my book. <laughs> Sitting my cards on the table, all right? Uh, but the goal of the book was to give people quick, concise, biblical answers to a lot of different questions because I know everybody is busy in some way, shape, or form. So each answer is 500 words or less per answer. And so we start with why it's important. We go through seven C's, answering questions, and we wrap up how we use it to share the gospel. Lots of great answers, really short, snappy answers in that book. I encourage you to check that out. We have answers for kids, phenomenal resource. Books about dinosaurs, the dragon legends for you, uh, older kids, younger kids, for adults, all sorts of great DVDs, so many things to check out. Let me plead with you to take advantage of the YouTube special while you're here. It's a great way to get these resources. Uh, you know, we, we kinda, you kind of something like this. You hear a speaker, you see the museum, you go to the Ark Encounter, you get all this great information. But studies show within three days, you'll forget how much do you think percentage-wise around 90 percent. That makes me really sad because I'm working hard, all right? <laughs> we worked hard at the museum. So we want to equip you with these books and DVDs so when you do forget, as we all do, you have these to fall back on, to read, and to share, to share the gospel effectively. 